Once man was an ape. As an ape, he was one with his instincts. He followed the voice of nature without hesitation. But then his eyes were opened. He became the strangest and sickliest of all the animals. He acquired the illness of shame and bad conscience. Thus the ape became man. This strange outcast of a creature left the jungle for civilization where he no longer obeyed the laws of nature and his instincts. Instead, he imposed culture and morality upon nature's amoral will to life. This is the source of man's suffering. He is at war with himself, with nature, with God. But although man is the most bungled of all the animals, the greatest tragedy would be for man to return to his state when he was not at war with himself, to return to the ape. I wish for you to be at war with yourselves, to destroy yourselves, create yourselves with the godlike power of your vision and the hammer of your will. Think not of returning to the ape, think instead of creating the Superman. Nietzsche believed that the Genesis story was life-denying because it views life outside of Eden as a mistake, an error which must be reversed. For Nietzsche, life itself is a war between different energies, between different competing organisms. So to reject this struggle of creation and long for the eternal peace of paradise is a rejection of life itself. However, as we discussed in my last video, the interpretation of Genesis which Nietzsche received had strayed far from its original meaning. When we understand Genesis as a description, not of man's fall from paradise, but rather of how and why our species is different from and separated from the other animals, then Genesis actually perfectly illustrates Nietzsche's ideas. In Human, All Too Human, Nietzsche wrote, Error has transformed animals into men. Is truth perhaps capable of changing man back into an animal? Here Nietzsche essentially condenses the Genesis story's original meaning into a single sentence. In Eden man was an animal, but an error, a mistake, caused him to become man. Is it possible for us to return to Eden? In the Antichrist, Nietzsche wrote, We no longer trace the origin of the human being in spirit, in divinity. We have placed it back among the animals, and even in asserting that, we assert too much. The human being is, relatively speaking, the most bungled of all the animals, the one most dangerously strayed from its instincts. But for all that, he is of course the most interesting. When you read Genesis in the context of its Near Eastern origin, and strip away later interpretations of Adam and Eve being immortal in Eden, then the Genesis story also places the origin of man among the animals. With man's theft of the knowledge of good and evil, he becomes the most bungled and sickliest of all the animals because of his higher consciousness. This higher consciousness makes him the most interesting animal, and makes him in many ways like the gods, capable of creative vision and will, but it also makes him the most dangerously strayed from his instincts. With a man's acquisition of higher consciousness comes also the illness of shame and bad conscience. Animals obey their instincts, which are the commands of nature, of life, without hesitation. They are one with the will of life, and when they hear or feel the command of this all-powerful animating force which lives within nature, they are powerless to do anything but obey, and they want nothing else than to obey. They want what nature wants. And what is this vital life force which animates biological life, if not God? Man, however, can disobey his instincts. He can disobey God. Man has a will which is independent from the will of nature. He is able to impose his own values over the will of nature and life which lives inside of him. Unlike the animals, man is self-conscious. He is able to think about what is good or bad for him. He has knowledge of good and evil, and can act according to his own will by overruling the voice of nature within him. This allows man to organize himself into societies, and to adhere to moral and cultural laws and customs which might benefit him in the long term, while repressing and overruling his instinctual desires which might cause him to be ostracized from civilization. 
Unlike the other animals, man has this voice within him called shame or bad conscience, which he uses to regulate his actions so that he can adhere to the social codes of civilization. All of this causes man to be separated from nature, both without, since civilization causes him to live somewhat separated from the natural world, and within, since his instincts are no longer the primary driver of his will. This is illustrated in Genesis when Adam and Eve are ashamed to show themselves to God, and God covers their nakedness in fig leaves. Their natural nakedness, their animal natures, are covered by the clothes of civilization. Their instincts are concealed by the pretenses, the laws and customs of life in human society. Man's heightened consciousness also causes him to suffer from life in a way in which animals don't, and since he can disobey life, he has a tendency to turn away from life, to hide himself from God, in the language of Genesis. When we understand Genesis through this light, Nietzsche's passage from the Antichrist might almost sound like a commentary on Genesis. The main concern of Nietzsche's philosophy is the domestication of man into a meek, timid creature which lacks any creative power, or for that matter, destructive power. He is afraid that man, once a lion, will become a declawed house cat. Nietzsche writes, To call the taming of an animal its improvement is in our ears almost a joke. Whoever knows what goes on in menageries is doubtful whether the beasts inside of them are improved. They are weakened. They are made less harmful. They become sickly beasts. It is no different with the tamed human being. Animals have to say yes to life and nature, but man can renounce life and choose death. Man can choose to do what is harmful to life, what restricts life. He can choose not to engage in the war of creation. He can reject the will to power and life which is within him and choose the eternal peace of death. In the Antichrist, Nietzsche wrote, I call an animal, a species, an individual, corrupt when it loses its instincts, when it chooses, when it prefers what is harmful to it. The reason why Nietzsche rejected the Genesis story of his day can best be illustrated through Rousseau, who Nietzsche often ridiculed. The foundation of Rousseau's philosophy is an historicized version of the Christian interpretation of Genesis. In the state of nature, man was at peace. There was no war or conflict, and there was greatly reduced suffering. However, in civilization, man became corrupted. Life became suffering, exploitation, struggle, and war. In Rousseau's philosophy, you can see the same longing for a paradise of eternal peace which is expressed in Christianity. Naturally, Nietzsche rejected this since he believed that life is war and struggle. However, when you understand Genesis as a description of man's transformation from animal to man, then you could argue that Nietzsche's philosophy actually supports the idea of a return to Eden, or rather aiming for a new Eden, in which man is like he was in Eden but also transformed into something higher and more godlike. In Thus Spake Zarathustra, Nietzsche wrote, All beings thus far have created something beyond themselves, and do you want to be the ebb of this great flood, and even go back to the beasts rather than overcome man? What is an ape to man? A laughingstock or a painful embarrassment, and man shall be just that to the overman. In order to reverse the domestication of man, Nietzsche prescribed the idea of the reanimalization of man. But this does not mean returning to the beast. For Nietzsche, man is something which must be overcome. For Nietzsche, man is a rope stretched between beast and superman. But to realize the superman, we must reclaim the raw, instinctual dynamism which we enjoyed as beasts. Nietzsche contrasted his vision of the last man, the domesticated and denatured man, with that of the superman, the man who has been made more terrible, more powerful, more fearsome but therefore also more creative and more good, a man who has not stifled the life force within him or subverted the will of nature, but who has intensified it and made it more powerful and potent. Nietzsche's superman is also a super beast, a beast man, 
a man who embraces his instincts and obeys the commands of nature. He thereby says yes to the amoral struggle of creation and does not shrink from life in shame or bad conscience. He dares to embrace nature, within and without, as it truly is, without the clothing of morality and civilization which we use to dress up reality and make it more acceptable to us. This is Nietzsche's vision of a return to Eden and nature, not Rousseau's paradisal nature, but nature as she truly is, terrible, ruthless, and fearsome, but also boundlessly beautiful, creative, and gentle. Nietzsche viewed Rousseau's idealization of nature as an absurd fiction about what nature is really like, and as the unconscious expression of a regressive impulse to shrink away from the violent, creative struggle of life, as an impulse to reject reality for being evil as compared with some imagined paradisal state of peace, which never existed and never could exist. Nietzsche contrasted the Genesis myth with the Prometheus myth, in which man also begins in an animal state, but one which is in no way desirable. Man lives miserably, swarming beneath the earth like ants in dark caves, without sight and without purpose, until Prometheus gives man the power of vision and of light, and teaches man the arts of civilization. While the Genesis myth places emphasis upon the ways in which man is cut off from nature and strayed from his instincts, a phenomena which Nietzsche acknowledges, the Prometheus myth places emphasis upon the creative power which man acquires with his heightened consciousness, a power which is required to create Nietzsche's Superman. Thus we see that neither myth is actually correct, they simply offer different perspectives, both of which are needed for understanding and creating the Superman. If we want to overcome man, we must reconnect with our instincts and with nature, this is why Nietzsche loved the figure of Dionysus, who represents the creative frenzy of nature, breaking through the veil of civilization. To avoid our total domestication, we must embrace the vital life force which is inside all of us, as the ancient European pagans sought to do in their rituals and cults. We must disregard anything which makes us weaker, meeker, more tame, more domesticated, more timid, more sterile. We must embrace what makes man hard, barbaric, powerful, for these things elevate our creative powers and allow us to overcome ourselves. From Ted Kaczynski to the return to monkey meme, we are beginning to recognize the danger which the denaturing of man in civilization poses. The danger of a civilization which stifles and smothers life. But it is not civilization as such which is the problem. The danger is a civilization which domesticates man, a civilization whose only inheritance is the total destruction of all which is worthwhile in man. Instead of rejecting civilization itself, we should embrace the Promethean vision of civilization, the civilization of the barbarian, of the creator, of the higher man. We are the only self-conscious animal, the only animal aware that we carry the flame of life within us and the only animal with the ability to stoke and direct that flame, to seize the raw and violent energy of the life force within us, and to direct it towards the creation of superhuman ideals. Once man was an animal, but now our powers are infinitely more abundant than that of any animal. So could we not also overcome man? But we shrink from this task. It is easier to shrink from life than to embrace the war of creation. It is easier to believe that we are the pinnacle of evolution than to strive to overcome ourselves. But my brothers, I bid you, think not of returning to the ape. Think instead of creating the Superman. Superman.